Hello friends, in this video we're going to look at this vintage reel to reel tape recorder that I got at the thrift store. I got this with another unit for $15, so let's say this one cost $7.50. It's marked $29.99 originally, but it uh, had been sitting around for a while and the lady there seemed glad to be rid of it. In fact, she chased me out the door to sell it to me because I was kind of on the fence about it. It's RCA Victor. Done a little bit of research on this and haven't been able to find much information on it. Based on what I've seen and some guesses, this might date to the mid 50s. It says it's hard to read here, but Belltone of Chicago. And I kind of know that partly because on the inside it says, turn it sideways, property of Belltone, Chicago. I've taken a brief look at this, but we're going to uh, look at it n new. One thing that's very strange, it has what appears to be a uh, 16 millimeter film roll where one of the take-up reels would be, and that does not work at all. It has this very quaint looking microphone. We can test that to see if it works plugs in with a standard phono jack. We've got the RCA logo here of his master's voice and I've seen from my research there's supposed to be a cover plate here that also has an RCA logo on it. That's not essential but it would be nice to have as a collector's item. This is something I hadn't noticed before. I identified the model number from pictures, but here it's spelled out 7-TR-2 RCA Victor. We have a two-prong unpolarized plug, which this polarized plug hadn't been invented yet. Some schmutz. And I have another vintage tape recorder like this, a uh, different brand that uh, has this kind of storage compartment I think like they've done here these are supposed to have you know blank tapes in them or whatever this is not only a blank tape but it's a blank box I researched that in case the boxes were something but it's not so that's okay We've got radio phono probably an output here normal and overload which is probably helps you set your levels microphone input and the microphone is mono so we know this is a mono unit we have tape speed here off 3.5 that means inches per second or 7.5 inches per second so with these you could change the tape speed to have either a high speed which is kind of a high fidelity high quality versus a lower speed which would be a longer length. This has a nice feature I haven't seen before of a uh, tape index so wherever the tape comes out in the reel here you could kind of keep notes about you know my favorite songs at about 50 on the tape. We have the standard tape recorder controls here play, fast reverse, fast forward record and I've seen this before on my other unit something like this this is a sort of a safety button to keep you from accidentally pushing it down and erasing your tape so you can't push this without also pushing the lock button we got a big stop bar here as opposed to kind of a conventional button got the tape head which probably has built-in erase head some tape transport wheels and based on the weight and the vintage of this we know that it's a tube unit here's a grill on the bottom for ventilation to uh, cool off the mechanism notably the vacuum tubes I see a volume and tone control looks like probably the tones on the outside and the volumes on the inside since that's a lot easier to deal with 
transport uh, reels here. So next we're going to plug this in and see what sort of scary thing it does. It could be nothing, it could be smoke, it could be that it works fine. So I've plugged it in here but I have the power strip off. As a safety note, it looks like this is all plastic and non-conductive wood and decal materials. So hopefully there isn't a shock hazard here. But we'll try that out. I've got it plugged in through this kilowatt power meter. Came right to life. Stop. Won't stop. Let's go to off. Still going somewhat fast. We'll do watts. Oh, I guess that's just winding down in speed. So we're at zero watts, so this is truly off. So let's go to 375. Well, that's quite an adventure. Makes a nasty hum. So it looks like this has multiple problems. Now one thing the lady at the thrift shop told me was that this and the other unit I bought were the last remnants of some sort of large assortment of audio equipment that she'd gotten uh, maybe from a storage locker. She said the guy who'd been there before was a audio engineer. Maybe she's just guessing. But anyway, my thought is that this probably didn't work or else he, you know, would have fixed it or maybe it would have been a side project. I'm going to turn that on again at the risk of more nasty hum. Let's see if we can get our watts. 100 watts. Okay. Well, we're just going to turn that off for now. So the amp has some problems of some kind. The mechanism has problems. This is a mono unit, so it doesn't have any practical value in today's world. I've seen these on eBay for maybe $50 or so. Um, you know, it's so heavy it would cost that much to ship it, maybe. So, just based on the problems that this has, the fact that it's not you know, one of a kind or any kind of museum item. It's pretty banged up. Um, I think we can go ahead and make a, an executive decision that this is going to be a salvage unit. So I'm going to unplug that and we'll proceed to take it apart. So before I take this apart, let's uh, go over a safety issue here. Since I just powered this up, it may have some voltages stored in capacitors inside the unit even though I've unplugged it. So I'm going to be careful uh, not to touch anything as I take it apart and then to discharge the capacitors. There are other vi YouTube videos on how to do that uh, so I won't go into that a whole lot but anyway uh, with a tube type unit like this they typically have 300 volts inside them that can be stored in capacitors so they can be dangerous even when they're totally unplugged. So for comparison, here's the gutted remains of a Voice of Music tape recorder that was a better one from maybe five or ten years later. This one was stereo. I took the mechanism out of this one and left just the tube amplifier which needs to have new capacitors and tubes replaced and things, but it has some potential. That's kind of a long-term shelf project for now. Now it isn't really obvious how to take this apart. There are screws on this bottom grill, but that's uh, probably not going to do much if anything, except maybe take off the bottom grill. We've got another grill here on the side that I hadn't noticed. Looks like these are the main screws that would have been in there that the previous owner already took out. So I think it's going to be a 
matter of just kind of lifting this out as a unit. So we'll try that. Tried pulling this out as a unit and that didn't work. It's caught on something here on the front. And I suspect what they've done is hidden some screws underneath here. So this might be kind of a kind of a thing that you take apart in layers. I guess I won't worry about marking this up too much since it's no more. So here's one screw here. It's probably a matching one under here. Yep. Pull those out. I'm guessing once I take this plastic plate off there's going to be more screws holding it into the overall cabinet. So these screws here are just holding down the plastic piece basically. That's the guess anyway. So that pops off quite easily. Okay, so here are the larger screws that I was thinking were holding the overall unit down. There might be more, but I think these would probably have to do with with what's going on here. While we're at it, let's look at this control mechanism. We've got a stop bar, and the way I've seen this work on the other tape recorders of this kind of general vintage is, you know, this is a day before there were any microcontrollers, obviously, so everything is mechanical and with these switches you're not just turning something on you're actually moving something around they're pretty hard to move and these are kind of uh, this is what later came to be called radio buttons which is you can only push one down at a time and then this stop bar basically releases whatever button is pushed down so something like this has not only the electronic part of the tube amplifier and the magnetic heads and the mechanical part of the transport mechanism but it also has some clever mechanics as far as the uh, the rest of it goes you can see here we've got a detent here that gives us a nice a nice uh, mechanical feel of where you get to each setting. So here's the mic input and the radio phono output that we saw earlier. I guess they call it, yeah, radio phono. So we'll take these screws out. It looks like this one is stripped, but I might be able to come up with something on that. Turns out this one that was kind of partly stripped and the head is uh, easily taken out so okay now I'm ready to try to lift this unit out again out of the chassis just broke this little light bulb by pushing sideways on it that's not really a tragedy but it's shows that I should slow down and be a little more careful I guess so I tried lifting this out and it's so heavy that I decided to just kind of put it up on end here and sort of pop it out So as I suspected, this kind of flops out easily as a unit with only the speaker to uh, just unhook the speaker and ready to go here. Now this has a date code on it on the speaker which is often a way to date things so we here we can see the guts of it motor which as I've seen before this is uh, probably some type of synchronous motor that gives it its time base so that the tape is recorded at the proper speed includes a built-in fan 
you can see down here that the tape head is revolving in the current setting. There's probably some sort of clutch that goes with the buttons that locks this in and out and moves these wheels around. So basically all of the rotary power of this is coming from this motor, including the fan. Then the other elements are run by the same motor but with mechanical switching in effect to, uh, here's a brake mechanism. Brakes and clutches basically transfer the rotary motion of the fan around to different uh, settings. You can see here this is a connector. We've got what appears to be a fairly simple tube amplifier. That's going to be basically our our value added here as well as maybe the speaker has some value. I kind of don't think so but it's possible. Over here on this unit it has a large hole here for either construction or possibly maintenance purposes or really both. Is Now we've got this speaker entirely separated. So this is nothing but a box speaker and this uh, vent grill which is essentially part of the box. Okay, I've unscrewed the speaker. Here it is. This is the big feature here. This number 274621. The first three digits are the manufacturing code and the, the last uh, three are the date code. And if I remember correctly, this would translate into year six so I'm gonna guess 1956 you have to kind of know the the prefix on that and then week 21 of 1956 so that makes sense with what I've seen online this is from about 1956 the speaker itself seems to be in fine condition so if that has any resale value that's uh you know, I might be able to get my 750 right out of that. So turning this around, we can see that this tube amplifier is kind of a module. It's enclosed on the bottom, which means it isn't a safety hazard for me to deal with as it is until I would take the bottom off. So topologically, we can see what's going on here. These are shielded tubes, so they probably have to do with the audio input and maybe for the uh, there has to be an oscillator for the erase head system that's erased with a basically an ultrasonic type uh, frequency this transformer connects to the speakers so we know that that's the standard speaker transformer that you need with tube amplifiers this is the power transformer over here which looks like it's kind of had better days, but you know, might be okay, who knows. These are probably the driver tubes for the uh, audio output. Since this is modular, I'm going to go ahead and pull it off. And, you know, we may have a standalone tube amplifier that has some value. Got one little connector here. It's three prongs. Pull it off. So it looks like I've got a captive rivet there. Taking off everything else here. I opened up this, I took off this bracket here, but that opens up the end. So we may have to look at making sure I don't get in underneath there. This mechanism relates to the off and speed control. It has this retainer screw on it. And you have to figure out some way to free all this up. Looks like essentially this shaft is... Uh, 
goes to a power switch that's built into the amplifier module. So looking at these three prongs here, this is a kind of a heavy cord. It looks like it goes to the motor and switches it uh, to either the high speed or low speed. And then the forward or reverse is probably run by mechanisms involving the belts and cams that are here. Actually, maybe I'll just pull that off like that. Okay. Sometimes I have a breakthrough in science while I've got the camera running. So this tab is kind of holding it down. I be able to lift the whole thing off. Oh, I see there's a connector over here that has to do with the audio jack and input of some kind. Probably another one somewhere. This is a kind of greasy, nasty stuff that may have made sense in the 50s, but it's not that much fun now. So I'm kind of held in at the moment by at least this uh, radio phono output. It's got this screw holding it on. A lot of times when you disassemble something, you kind of get an insight into how it was assembled in the first place. So this fishes through here. Excited about the light bulb. Okay, that'll snap off. So we freed up that assembly. There's a little hook there. So I think I've got this amp completely freed up. I'm going to be careful not to stick my hand in the end here. See if we're ready to lift this out yet. Okay, I guess that makes sense. I'm captive still on this microphone input, which it's one of those things that's obvious in retrospect. I tried to sweep up all the glass here that I broke earlier, but I have just learned that I missed some little sliver. Okay, now I think we're really ready to take this audio amp out. This little sword is ready. Oh, yep. Now we've got lights to deal with here. This is kind of devious. They put this screw down inside here, so you have to undo this little basket thing that goes with the microphone. Okay, third time's a charm. Let's see if we can take out the amplifier assembly. Hopefully, without breaking any tubes. Okay. Yay. The amplifier assembly is free. Here it is. Go ahead and push in that tube. Okay. So I'll do a little cleanup here. Then we'll proceed. So now that I've got the amp out, let's pull these tubes. This one is 6AQ5. That's probably an audio power tube. This is probably also 6AQ5. Let's see. Oh, this may be a rectifier tube or something. 6X4. Here, if we're really lucky, We've got the coveted 12AX7. 12AX7. So, as predicted, this one I'm guessing is also 12AX7. 50... 
79 or 5Q79 I'm not sure for those of you who are tube aficionados you may know that 12AX7 is the very widely used guitar preamplifier tube nowadays so it's still in demand uh, if this one works well it might be worth about twelve dollars just by itself the rest of this including the amp probably isn't worth much the power transformer may be worth a few bucks I doubt that the other tubes are but we'll look those up and find out for reference here's a shot of the mechanism with everything pulled out that's electronic and I realized later on that this is probably actually power input to the amplifier because the power cord goes in here and distributes to the motor and this switch so I'd have to look back on my video to find out what switch this is but it must be the off and speed control switch so I was wrong on my guess on that earlier we'll figure out what these three are maybe a you know a hot neutral and ground so to speak even though this is a two conductor plug-in this may also include the inside the amplifier the dreaded death capacitor which I think was typically used on these designs that had two prongs from before the three prong era which might have been in the 70s or 80s I'm not sure now another thing uh, tube amplifiers of this era typically included a little diagram of the tube placement to help you uh, self-service those if you wanted to so we see that here this is pretty dirty but uh, looks like the tube I wasn't couldn't read the number on is 5879 so let's try to get a better view of the tag I might have to pull that out to photograph it well but anyway it doesn't have any date is the serial number RVG 005497 and the model is 7-TR-2 RCA Victor Victrola tape recorder it says 100 watts I believe gone ahead and taken off all the mechanical pieces off the main assembly here put it on top of these boards and we're gonna try to run it from strictly a mechanical standpoint pushing the buttons and see how the gears and clutches and things work for safety I'm going through this power strip and in particular this isolation transformer that I built in one of my early videos I've got a watt meter here where I can see what the wattage is so I can turn this on and off at either this point or this point and then see the wattage now the wattage capability of this is approximately uh, you know in the 60 watt range I believe but really the only thing we'll have running is this uh, motor which is probably in the you know 10 watts or something we'll find out and as an aside these mechanical pieces actually might find some future use in particular with the uh, amplifier that we looked at this little box that originally held the microphone uh, might make a nice little project box I see there's a probably 50 year old fingerprint on it it's got this electrical tape on it which is held up rather well for actually more than that 60 70 years for reference here's a good shot of the ID plate I tore that out of the uh, case and I've since thrown the case away I'm going to turn this on for the first time since it was all one piece and as you will recall the motor ran no matter what the switch setting was 
So to give you the upside down view, this is the stop bar, which should stop any mechanical rotation. Now I believe the motor and the fan would run anytime it's powered on. I don't remember if it's an on off state or not at the moment, but we'll find that out. So to start with I can just turn on my isolation transformer and then my power strip and we'll see what happens. Nothing so far. Zero watts. So we'll assume it's turned off. Got the power strip turned off. But let's look at this off switch, in particular this mechanical area here. You can see this is a cam that moves these two rubber idler wheels. So that's going to control the speed. So we have an offsetting here somewhere. I think off was in the middle of the two speeds. So this is one speed. I'll just turn the fan blade a little bit to show that. You can see that the main idler wheel is uh, is running with that. Go to the other speed. And this bottom idler wheel is engaging. So that has to do with speed. The engagement of the wheels probably doesn't matter at all in the off position. Get a nice good click there. There's a mechanical part here that has to do with this switch. So that's on and off I guess. I don't know. We'll find out. I'm going to try the different settings on this until I find one that runs in one direction or the other. If we go all the way in one direction, we're going to expect this top idle wheel to move around as the fan. So here we turn on our power strip. Well, that didn't do it. Turn it this way. Turn on our power strip. So we've got a lot of things running here. Let's look at our watts. 80 watts, probably at the limit of what my isolation transformer can do. So we're going to stop there for now and see if. Uh, oh, I see this. Uh, this wheel is catching underneath. I can feel that. So I was thinking of just the center pin being freed but it turns out there's a disc about the same size on the other side and here so let's turn that on again so here the spring is not engaged but that may be due to the uh, mechanics going wrong. I'm going to push some of the other buttons on here. We'll see what happens. So here it's it's kind of gummed up. This whole mechanism might need to be lubricated. You can hear the the motors humming which means it's struggling and it's not quite getting there. It goes if I give it a little help. So I'm going to push the stop bar, 
we'll go the other direction see what happens motor needs a little help again so it's hard to know exactly why this isn't working it may need to be lubricated maybe the belts are stretched out too much um, that's not a real big concern since I'm going to scrap all this anyway so let's just go ahead and turn it off and we can look at the mechanics of these buttons in isolation let's focus for the moment on these brakes this is a brake with a pad and this one also those pads you can expect could be worn down after 50 years although you know who knows how long I keep saying 50 years it could be more like 65 so we've got the brakes off when we're in one of the forward or reverse speed settings I'll just turn the little fan blade to kind of make everything go after we go to stop the brakes kick back in you don't want the tape reels to keep moving after the thing is done whatever you wanted it to do so this is the probably fast forward setting the brakes come off got it all unplugged we're going to go through the buttons one at a time so this first one this first button here is play I'm going to rotate the fan blade whichever way it goes so this would be the take up reel and it's going clockwise gonna hit stop and hit record which is the fourth button that should have the same motion as play which is what we're seeing here hit stop Let's go to the fast forward, which is the third button. I expect this to run faster. Which it appears to. In all these cases, this left reel, which is normally where the tape would be, is just idling. So we go to stop again. Now we're going to do fast rewind, which is the second button. And that's the only one that should engage this. So this one should be idling more or less. And this one should be engaged with the fan blade. So that's what I see there. This one's going counterclockwise. And this one is not quite idle but it's it's pretty loose and it's moving a little bit along with the uh, the spring the spring is acting as a belt and it might be a little bit worn out but that basically all works as intended so I think the mechanical problems that this had relate to its uh, you know lack of lubrication and maybe stretched out belts um, since I'm going to salvage it anyway that doesn't really matter to me so we still got a mystery to solve here for this three pin connector this went into the amplifier originally I thought at one time it was power but this is a braided signal pin apparently so I think we'll just tear that down as we go another thing I noticed here that's quite unusual to me when I first saw it we have cast iron here and in some of these pieces this is an idler wheel that gives it rotational inertia and also works against these rubber wheels here but you'll notice we've got copper here We've got a lot of copper here, copper here, here. 
a little copper on some of the other pieces here. Now in the 50s copper was not nearly as expensive as it is nowadays. There's been a lot of demand for copper increase over the years. So they might have been able to be more generous with copper. It's easier to work with on a machining level. And I also wonder if like on this piece it may have a heat sink feature that basically spreads out some of the heat that comes off the motor but it's also in a lot of the mechanical pieces so the heat sink theory is not really uh, not really the full story maybe it might be that as a manufacturing process they found this easier to work with to stamp out the machine parts and so on So in the spirit of this channel, I'm going to go ahead and start taking this assembly apart. I'll kind of show it to you at each stage. And we can look at uh, some of the mechanics inside here that are hard to see otherwise. But I think you've gotten a lot of the basics of it already. You know, in simplest form, we've got a lot of mechanical interchanges that are operated by the five buttons, including stop, that make mechanical linkages that turn a constant speed motor into different speeds and different directions on the reels. I've taken off this uh, switch. It's the first thing, these two screws here. That just lifts right off. You can see that that engages with this little piece here, which I've been operating manually like that. We've got some power wires. Here's the power connector to the amplifier. That's worth keeping to go with the amplifier. This wire is under this copper hook, so I'll just bend up that hook and uh, pull it out. I pulled up this hook and was able to fish this wire out. I'm not actually excited about any of this as a reuse piece uh, in, that relates to the switch itself so I'm just going to go ahead and cut all those wires. Now as a little editorial aside in my organ teardown video I got one comment from a viewer saying basically how dare you destroy this piece of history and you know the honest truth is that these things aren't really museum pieces and I kind of feel like I'm saving it for history in the form of video in a way by tearing it down because if any are in pristine shape they might end up in a museum but if future historians want to find out how you made a tape recorder in 1956 now you know. Now we've got our power plug saved for the amplifier which I've got on the shelf. This little uh, power switch thing that probably go in the trash. Really nasty old power cord. That'll go in the trash. And we can begin taking this motor assembly off of here. Here's a little piece I just took off. This is a little hook that held a bundle of wire. Nowadays you'd use tie wraps for that, but they hadn't been invented yet. Taking screws out here, and there was one nut. So we're going to lift this whole thing off, and hopefully, it won't pieces won't go flying. Okay. So, assuming this motor is worth saving, this is a nice mounting bracket. We've got a belt to go with that, which is probably past its useful life but who knows got other elements that be taken off with set screws and so on I'm gonna go ahead and do that just to kind of get the inner body take this little spring off Oh, 
I can do this wheel. Now I can do our other wheel on this side. Put it in play to get the brake off of it. Let's go ahead and take this main one off. A couple of things to note here. This has a very nice chime sound that you may have heard throughout the video. Bell like quality. Also, I realized again that something I'd realized in the previous video, which is this is not cast iron, it's it's aluminum. So I've got a magnet here, and the magnet sticks to what I thought was copper. But let's say it's copper plated steel. Maybe they decided to uh, use copper plating for some reason. I thought that using actual solid copper was a little bit exotic, so that explains it. This is also a rare case where the very first Allen wrench that I tried was perfect. further with that. Fish this belt off. I'm going to go back to the stop setting to get that loose. So we're still wrapped around the axle here. Another point I realized along the way that the obvious, which is this is the signal that goes to the record play head, and it may even go to the erase head. I'm not sure if this thing actually even has an erase function, but it should have, ideally. Maybe since this is a very early model reel to reel tape recorder, they, they lived without that. The erase function needs a high frequency oscillator which complicates the amplifier design. Um, so an economic point of view would be to leave out the erase function completely and people could either use blank tapes that were pre-erased or another method that I discovered when I was a kid is you could just run a constant magnet along it at high speed. Now that doesn't give you the full fidelity recording the high frequency erase head is required for full fidelity recording but it's something that's potentially optional if you're willing to go with low fidelity I'm going to loosen this one so this is the post that held up the motor originally along with these three cast posts. I don't know why they didn't cast all four of them. Maybe it was they needed to be able to put this in last after the rest of the assembly. We'll find out. So typically if you take something apart in the most simple straightforward logical way you end up reversing the assembly process. Here I'm going to pry off some of these rings. I haven't done a lot of that before so you'll see me fumble around with it oh I got the tool on backwards I've tried to get these snap rings off with this cheap uh, general use snap ring tool that I got at Harbor Freight. I needed that for my uh, bandsaw belt video. But it turns out it's not up to the job. So 
since I don't plan to reuse this anyway, I'm just going to take the old Dremel tool to it. So here we go. It actually got red hot, which I didn't expect, but broke up enough that this will just come right off. So let's lift that. We can see more of this mechanism inside. So these brakes are operated on a lever and spring system. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, might leave some of these on. Looks like I've got to take this one off to get more of the assembly off, including the at least the this belt here, which I might want to save for use with uh, some of the other pulleys. So that's. A smaller one. Let's see if we can just pinch that off with pliers. Okay, that isn't working so we'll try the Dremel method again. Now this should just break apart basically. Do a little bit more. It's amazing how quickly that snap ring can get red hot under the tutelage of the Dremel tool. Okay, let's try to lift that up and see what happens. There's some springs over here. Not sure how far I can go without taking this other one off. We'll do what we can. That's enough to get the belt out, I think. Almost. A little persuasion there. Yay, there's the belt. Let's work the mechanism here again with a lot of pieces removed. So you can see it in action. So this first one is play. Let's play. Stop. Rewind. Stop. Fast forward. Stop. And record. Which should be mechanically the same as play, I think. There may be some difference in terms of Some switching element, there must be a difference, but I don't know if that's somehow purely electrical that goes through a switch. This is play, this is record. Oh, I think the difference is communicated through this. Let's try that. So this rod must activate a switch that's inside the amplifier, I believe, that goes from record and play. So from a mechanical point of view, record and play are basically the same, but from an electrical point of view, we need to amplify the signal that comes off of the recording head versus for play versus sending in the input signal for record. Now let's flip it over and take out some of our remaining pieces. I guess it's worth looking at the mechanism from this side also. Play, reverse, 
forward and record. So this interlock thing is kind of very local to this button somehow, probably just right underneath there. So I'm going to take off the tape head assembly, which is probably the last thing of, of any real interest to me here. Um, you know, a lot of neat mechanical pieces, but from either a salvage or reuse point of view, not too much there. You know, just for fun, we'll throw this in my big box of random screws. I learned many years ago to keep a big box of random screws because you never know when you're going to need a random screw. This one doesn't seem to want to go anywhere. Okay, let's take off our record playback head, which should be just these two screws, I believe. It's kind of toasty in here from the dermal tool. I hope you people at home have uh, Odorama equipped YouTube subscriptions. Now that might be all, or there might be more. So here we can fish the tape head assembly through. That's the kind of thing that really I don't have much use for the tape head. That's kind of a kind of an archaeological item. But the cable is actually more useful for reusing the amplifier. These little pointed things just unscrew. See so we can pull these tape transport things out. Anybody need some exotic pasties? That's a kid's safe joke, by the way, because kids don't know what pasties are. So I guess I'll go ahead and take all the screws out of here that make this easy and then kind of plan to throw away whatever isn't easy intact. I'm going to try to lift this all out. Who knows what wreckage will ensue like we're hooked from the bottom still. I only took out two screws there. Let's go ahead and do these and kind of it'll kind of finish off this mechanism as any kind of viable thing because Probably never be able to figure out how to put it together again, nor would I want to. Okay, we've got one spring under here holding it together. Let's see if we can fish that out without destroying it. So, my general philosophy is to try to Save things intact, such as a spring, small hardware pieces. Um, honestly, you know, you're never going to end up using those in a lot of cases, but that's what the junk box is for. It's kind of a value proposition of something small that you can keep organized, you know, like out. Call the ambulance. Something small like this is can go in a spring box and you know you might use it someday and you might not, but it doesn't take up any space and if it's well organized then it's useful if you just throw it in a in a kind of a general hardware box, you know, you'll probably never find it if you want it. So we've got a lot more of these snap rings going on here. I've had enough snap ring fun for now. So uh, let's turn it back over. I don't think there's anything too interesting there to see. Maybe I can pull these pieces out now. Okay. That's not all bad. These have their own little 
things. You know, as editorial comment, the mechanical design of something like this in a way is more impressive than the electrical design because, uh, you know, the tube amplifier and all that is, is pretty straightforward in this era for the RCA people. I don't know if these, oh, those are cast in. You know, RCA people knew all about how to make tube amplifiers. But if you're going to make a very early reel-to-reel -reel tape recorder like this in 1956 um, and make it economical for the consumer market, you know, it's, it's actually pretty complicated mechanical design. You can see there are a lot of parts here. And so, you know, hat tip to the whoever it is that designed these things in the 50s. And after you make design one, you can, you know, evolve the second and third one from that, which is kind of how engineering is typically done. So. As you may have guessed, we're about ready to wrap this one up, but let's take a final survey of what we've got. Motor, lots of pulleys, a belt that goes with this motor, mechanical assembly that's of no real use, aluminum chassis frame, some miscellaneous hardware, some of which will get thrown away, some of which will go in the junk box. We've also got a couple of uh, cables that are useful with the tube amplifier. I hope to do a separate video where I go into the tube amplifier in detail, but uh, you know we'll see if time permits on that. It's a very simple amplifier as those go, so it's probably a good one to look at from sort of a tube amplifier study point of view. Before you stop this video, be sure to hit like and subscribe for me. Please. Thanks for watching. Bye bye.